The Second World War, despite its fatal darkness, gave rise to many stories of people who defied their own limits and astonished an entire world. In a patriarchal society, where women had little role in the fighting, one woman surprised everyone with her extraordinary talent, skill, and self-determination. Her name is Lyudmila Pavlichenko, better known as Lady Death. The young sniper is recognized and admired for having shot to death no less than 309 Nazi soldiers. But her fame is also due to her being the first Soviet to be received with honors in the United States, since she was invited to the White House itself. What was the life of the most effective sniper in history like? And how did she kill more than 300 Germans? Sit back and get ready to learn about the fascinating military life of Lyudmila Pavlichenko. Are you ready? Then, prepare to travel back in time. On July 12, 1916, the town of Bila Tserkva in Soviet Ukraine witnessed the birth of one of the most important women in the history of the world's armed forces. At age 14, her family decided to move to the city of Kiev, where she took her first steps as a worker in an arms factory. As a teenager, she decided to join the Osoaviakim Shooting Club. Several years later, Lyudmila began her history studies at the University of Kiev. It was in June 1941, while training in this discipline, that Adolf Hitler's Germany began its invasion campaign in Soviet territory and sent more than 4 million soldiers and approximately 4,400 tanks. This was the beginning of what was popularly known as Operation Barbarossa. By this time, Lyudmila had made great strides in her rifle training and decided it was time to serve her homeland. With a brave spirit, she enlisted the ranks of the 25th Infantry Division of the Red Army. As you can imagine, regardless of her undeniable talent, the young woman had trouble being accepted just because she was born a woman. Initially, she was offered to work as a nurse, but she flatly refused. However, there was something about her that was going to surprise her superiors, and of the 2,000 women who ran to represent her country, Lady Death was one of the few who managed to climb the ranks. Many say that the highest authorities were shocked to see that she could shoot down any target that was placed in front of her eyes. However, without enough weapons for each soldier due to the surprise of the German attack, the first task she was assigned was digging trenches and her only weaponry was a hand grenade. Her debut battle took place over a period of two months in the city of Odessa. In this confrontation, Pavlichenko reached a surprising number of victims. 187 soldiers were annihilated thanks to the impeccable effectiveness of this skilled combatant who was beginning to show that women of war are to be feared. Forced to withdraw from the area, the troops in which the young girl participated moved to Sevastopol, within the Crimean Peninsula. There, her victim count rose to a whopping 257 and in a few months, her mark would reach no less than 309 casualties. Do you want to know what was the weapon that Lyudmila Pavlichenko used to achieve such a number of casualties? The sniper attacked her enemies with a Tokarev SVT-40 7.62mm semi-automatic rifle and a telescopic sight with a range of 800 meters. It featured a gas-actuated reload firing system and an oscillating bolt. Its maximum speed was 840 meters per second. Such was the terror caused by her technique that the Nazi army sent soldiers exclusively to get rid of her, but none could achieve it. Lady Death, who at first was far from being the first choice to enter combat, would be appointed a sergeant and later a lieutenant. Also, she was repeatedly offered to change sides and join the Nazi forces, but she bluntly rejected all of these offers. However, things would take an unexpected turn, as her military career lasted less than expected. In 1942, Lyudmila was unable to dodge a mortar fire that caused serious injuries, and she had no choice but to leave the battlefield. Because of her achievements and her courage, 
A month later, she was awarded the Golden Star and recognized as Hero of the Soviet Union, the highest decoration for members of the Red Army. After her retirement, Lyudmila Pavlichenko dedicated herself to training rookie shooters, but only for a short time, as other types of activities were in store for her. The head of the armed forces decided to use the image of the sniper for propaganda. She was sent to the United States as part of a campaign to stimulate the sending of troops to Europe. President Franklin Roosevelt received her with honors at the White House. She was not just another Soviet on American soil. She was the first person from that country to be welcomed by a U.S. government. Surprisingly, Lyudmila struck up an unexpected but fruitful relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady of the United States, and they set out on a tour of the country recounting the life experiences of the illustrious sniper. In addition to visiting the United States, Pavlichenko toured the United Kingdom and Canada, where she was presented with a Winchester rifle with a telescopic sight which is currently on display in the Museum of the Armed Forces in Moscow. Lady Death had to endure the sexist harassment of the time through questions that had little to do with the war itself. Asked by Time magazine about the type of clothing used in the fighting, Pavlichenko was blunt. It seems that for Americans, the important thing is whether women wear silk underwear under the uniform. They still have to learn what is it that the uniform represents. Upon returning to the Soviet capital, she finished her career as a historian at the University of Kiev, and from the end of the war until 1953, she was an assistant to the main headquarters of the Soviet Navy and an active member of the Soviet Committee of War Veterans. Undoubtedly, she was an active and passionate woman for the military world. On October 10, 1974, Lyudmila Pavlichenko died of a stroke. But there's a phrase that immortalized the sniper's career. When she was asked how many men she had killed, she didn't hesitate. Men, I don't know. Fascist 309. As is often the case, there are those who suspect that Pavlichenko's career was exaggerated for propaganda purposes. Some even dare to doubt that the amazing figure of casualties caused by the sniper is true. But there are plenty of those who praise her career and who, beyond the numbers, have no doubts about the legacy that Lady Death left in the military world. And now we want to ask you, what do you think of Lyudmila Pavlichenko's career? Do you believe in her legacy? Or do you think her career was exaggerated for propaganda purposes? 1944, somewhere on the Eastern Front, the Soviet advance towards Germany already seems unstoppable for the troops of the Third Reich. Confident by recent achievements and knowing that there are no enemy positions in the nearby territory, a young Soviet lieutenant leads a patrol without taking too many precautions. Like many others before him, his youth and lack of combat experience would end up working against him. In the blink of an eye and from nowhere, a shot hits him square in the chest. Immediately, the rest of the soldiers on the patrol try to take cover, but it's useless. In just a few seconds, another two shots echo through the air and two more troops fall to the ground. The remnant of the patrol flees in terror. A few hundred meters away, Matthäus Hetzenauer, a young Austrian sniper in his early 20s, is already leaving his firing position. He knows that staying there longer would be risking discovery even after his target has been an easy prey. This is a normal day in the life of Hetzenauer, a Wehrmacht sniper who would unknowingly become the most dangerous and deadly Nazi sniper during World War II and a living nightmare for Soviet commanders. With 345 confirmed deaths and as many unofficially attributed to him, he was one of three soldiers from Adolf Hitler's Germany to be awarded the Gold Sniper's Badge. That being said, do you want to learn more about this German legend of long-range shooting? What weapons and techniques did he use? And what other renowned Austrian sniper did he meet on various missions? Join us as we explore the story of a young man whose telescopic rifle became an extension of his own arm.
Are you ready? Then prepare to travel back in time. Matthäus Hetzenauer was born on December 23, 1924, in Brixen in Thale, a town in the Alpine region of Austria. Already at a young age, he began to learn the art of hunting and camouflage thanks to his father, Simon Hetzenauer, who periodically hunted gazelles, deers, and turkeys to bring food to the table. These were skills that Matthäus quickly acquired, becoming an expert and skilled marksman using nature as a valuable ally and getting used to covering great distances on foot. All skills that would be key to his future in war. Something for which he did not have to wait too long because at the age of 17, in 1942, he was drafted into the German Wehrmacht Army and assigned to the 140th Mountain Rifle Reinforcement Battalion based in his native Austria. In this battalion, Hetzenauer trained for two years as a mountain infantryman, a terrain that was extremely familiar to him from his hunting experiences. It was during his training that several superiors noted his outstanding aptitude for long-range shooting. Consequently, from March to July 1944, he received military training as a sniper and was promptly assigned in that role to the Army's 3rd Mountain Division where he saw action against Soviet forces in Hungary, Slovakia, and the Carpathian Mountains. Without knowing it, Hetzenauer had found a job in which he would stand out from the rest of his colleagues. There is a motto among snipers, one bullet, one death. In a post-war interview published in 1967 by the Austrian magazine Trumpendist, Hetzenauer himself pointed out that if he were offered a more modern semi-automatic rifle, he would not accept it. Snipers don't need a semi-automatic weapon if they're really skilled, he explained. And when asked if he ever needed to take a second shot to finish off his targets, the Austrian sniper replied, almost never. So what weaponry did this fierce and deadly soldier use? His rifles of choice were the Carabiner 98K with a six-power telescopic sight, and less frequently, the Gavir 43 with a four-power telescopic sight. He didn't need much more. With these elements, he achieved 345 kills in less than a year of combat, a figure that, according to his statements, was actually much higher. The problem is, is that for them to count officially, they had to be confirmed visually by an officer or by two soldiers, and the snipers of that time worked on their own or accompanied by a single colleague. This was the case with Hetzenauer, who shared missions with Joseph Allerberger, another famous Austrian sniper also awarded the Golden Sniper Badge during World War II. Both Hetzenauer and Allerberger devoted all their efforts and skills to eliminating enemy commanders, sometimes skipping their primary orders to deal with their Soviet counterparts. And they did this for a very important and essential reason. At this point in the war, the Germans were significantly outnumbered by their attackers. Infiltrating between enemy lines and eliminating commanders was a very effective way to disrupt Soviet troops and delay their offensive as long as possible. Both recognized that the clothing of high-ranking officials was very helpful to them. Commanders can be easily recognized and shot from long range by their distinctive special uniforms. We managed to eliminate the leaders of the enemy attack up to eight times in the same offensive, they explained in the aforementioned interview. But although his statements made this sound simple, the task was far from it. Snipers had to stand still for hours and hours in the cold and snow. Many times they even had to set up their firing position in the dead of night and stay there until dawn, unless there was enough moonlight to try and do something. Apart from this, they had to wear a white uniform with white paint to camouflage the face and hands, and a holster of the same color for the weapon, in addition to the assembly of dolls to distract and locate inexperienced enemies something that wasn't always useful because the Soviets also had great marksmen. According to Hetzenauer, an important quality in addition to precision and long-range shooting is tactics. It is especially important to be more patient than the enemy, 
The one who handles these details better is the one who wins in a fight against other snipers," said the Austrian. It is worth noting that his longest officially registered shot with a confirmed death was from 1,100 meters away. Something admirable if we take the climatic and geographical conditions of the region into account, and the fact that the weapons available at the time did not have the current technology. Likewise, it must be said that Hetzenauer received five decorations, including the aforementioned Golden Sniper Badge and the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. However, the young Austrian sniper's war experience would not end well. A few months after being hit in the head by enemy artillery, he was captured by Soviet troops and sent to a prison camp. There he remained until 1950, when he was released, but not before spending years enduring torture and watching his companions die. The deadliest Austrian sniper of the Third Reich returned to his native country, where he married and lived a quiet small-town life as a carpenter. He died of natural causes in 2004, at the age of 79. He is still remembered today as one of the most effective snipers of World War II. And now it's time for you to tell us your opinion. Who is your favorite sniper from World War II? Leave us your answer below, and don't forget to subscribe and activate the notifications to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history. Thank you for joining us, and until the next video!